Leader Series. Uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Tom Buford. I am the new director of USIM, uh, taking over for the founding director uh, who built this thing, uh, Dr. Marcus Bauman. And so today's um, seminar is actually the conclusion of our 2019-2020 series, uh, which was supposed to have been scheduled uh, for many months ago when the world was quite a different place. And so uh, thanks for pivoting with us uh, to this online format. Um, as the kind of conclusion of that series, uh, Dr. Bauman uh, will, will kind of give our introduction to today's speaker. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, point out a couple of things really quickly um, for our session today. Uh, first, um, just kind of what we've recognized in this Zoom world that's in, enabled us to have the opportunity to, to speak with people, you know, without them being required to travel. On the other hand, we've also experienced um, many of you being on Zoom calls where, you know, if there's no interaction, uh, it, it can seem kind of uh, un, unrewarding for both uh, the speaker and the rest of us. So, um, you know, if you would, if you're comfortable, um, you know, any, anyone who's comfortable, you know, feel free, please turn on your camera. So at least Dr. Goodpastor has a sense that there's people here enjoying, um, enjoying and, and engaged. Um, and please, we, so we built in at least 75 minutes for the session. And a lot of times we run up against, you know, someone uh, talks a little bit long and everybody's got to jump off and that's fine. But we've at least built in that, you know, some of us will be here for um, a good amount of time to allow for questions. Um, thirdly, I'll just uh, point out, so for all of the trainees and uh, potentially any junior faculty who'd like to join, uh, there is a session after you know, the main uh, seminar with Dr. Goodpastor. And I'd encourage you to use that to, uh, you know, really utilize that time. You know, he's committed to time and we're appreciative of that. And, you know, get whatever you can, whether it's related to his uh, talk, you know, how, you know, how he made it as a PI, whatever you want to utilize. Uh, you know, we're very appreciative to Brett for dedicating that time to, uh, you know, all of our trainees and, and junior faculty. Um, and then lastly, I'll just point out that this uh, series will continue going forward on the second Monday of the month of each month, um, excluding December. Uh, there's just a lot going on in December. So uh, second Monday of the month at noon, uh, with still with the uh, trainee session afterward. Uh, next month's uh, speaker will be Zen Yan uh, from the University of Virginia. And, you know, we're hopeful to release the full schedule for this year soon. It's going to be a lot of awesome speakers, um, at least one of which will be international, uh, which the Zoom uh, has allowed us to do. Um, so, again, thanks to everyone for joining us uh, with that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Marcus, who can kind of give uh, the highlights of today's special lecture, which is the Gary Hunter uh, Award lecture, and then also uh, introduce Dr. Goodpastor. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, this is, uh, I'm extremely excited uh, to be here today and to be able to introduce Brett and also give you just a brief sort of background uh, for this distinguished lecture that has a special honor associated with it. So uh, it's hard to believe, but this is uh, year eight of the annual Gary R. Hunter Award Lecture within the UCEM Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, this was initiated based on Gary Hunter's very prolific career in both research and mentoring here at UAB. He essentially put UAB on the map in exercise biology and exercise medicine. And uh, this is our small way of honoring his contributions to establish a very strong program at UAB throughout his lengthy career, which began in 1984. Uh, when we originally laid out this lecture, of course, Gary was the first speaker in the series. And at that time, uh, he was already moving his way to retirement. But because he continued to remain invigorated and continues to do research, we have the good fortune of still seeing Gary on campus and he's still very active here at UAB. So uh, uh, 
again, thank you for, for joining today. And based on Gary's research focus, I could not think of a better honoree uh, than my good friend and colleague, Brett Goodpaster, today. Lots of scientific overlap with Gary, and I'll just quickly introduce Brett. So he is currently the scientific director uh, at the Translational Research Institute at Advent Health in Orlando, Florida. He's been now in Orlando for the last several years uh, working closely with uh, Steve Smith and others to build a very strong translational research program there, and he's now the director over the science, uh, rightfully so. Prior to that, Brett was, uh, had a longstanding and prolific career at University of Pittsburgh, rising through the ranks and establishing himself as a true national and international leader uh, in the fields of obesity, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and overall energy metabolism and the impact of exercise in the acute setting on the molecular transducers of ultimate adaptations to exercise. But at the same time, uh, he uncovered early in his career the athlete's paradox, which has become one of the most profound findings uh, that continues to be referenced today. And the paradox is based on the finding that both insulin-resistant individuals and highly trained endurance athletes have a lot of intramuscular and intramuscular lipid content, yet the athletes have a high insulin sensitivity. And so uh, uh, Brett discovered that and has been unfolding the mechanisms behind that, which has propelled uh, much of what he's been doing throughout his career. He also has a longstanding career in aging-related research and actually was the 2008 recipient of the Nathan Shock Award for the most uh, outstanding aging researcher in the country from the National Institute on Aging. So I won't go into uh, all of his current and past funding and his current uh, and past awards. There are many, many, but it's a great honor to have Brett with us. I will just tell you very briefly about his training history. So uh, undergraduate at Purdue University, a master's degree at Kent State, and then went to uh, Ball State for his doctorate and at Pittsburgh for his uh, postdoctoral training and again, stayed on there and rose through the ranks. Been involved in many, many, and helped lead many, many national uh, consortia, large-scale research studies, and is one of the key leaders of the uh, NIH uh, Common Fund Initiative, Molecular Transducers of Physical Activity Consortium uh, with us, and we're uh, great, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Brett with us today. So thank you, Brett, and it's all yours. All right, thanks so much, Marcus, for that really nice introduction. Um, obviously, I wish I was there in person. Um, I'll share my screen here and, and, and get started. But uh, let, me, let me just say a couple things. So first of all, it's, it's, it's been a real pleasure to get to know uh, Marcus Bauman over the last few years and our uh, work together on proposing Motor Pack and now working full steam in, in, in Motor Pack. And we've become good friends along the way. And it's, 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 really, um, it's really great to continue working with the group at UAB. Um, I've been down there, you know, a, a few times and had the privilege and honor to, to interact with, with Gary Hunter over the years um, during the few lectures that I've, that I've given at UAB, um, you know, again, over the last several years. We've had many really stimulating conversations around exercise and its effect on metabolism and body composition. So it's truly an honor uh, for me to, to present to you today. Um, if it feels a little awkward, <laughs> it will for me, because this is not the normal way of doing these things, obviously. So um, I, hope you'll, um, I hope you'll forgive me a little bit for the uh, awkwardness of, of doing this through Zoom. Hopefully it comes through okay. And um, I look forward to some, you know, some discussion and interactions afterwards. Um, if you have any burning questions, um, I guess I'll trust Pernima to you know, have me pause and maybe if somebody's got a hand up, we can, we can uh, pause along the way, but otherwise I'll just, I'll just kind of steamroll through and, and hopefully convey a few key messages, I think, to the group here. Um, Marcus indicated some of the work that I've done. I'll highlight that a little bit today. 
um, and really try to tell a story about how the work that I've done over the years has, has highlighted um, not only how and why exercise exerts its health benefits, but um, really, I think in, in a lot of ways, how we have used exercise as a tool, more or less, to, to try to unravel some of the mechanisms around the pathophysiology of, of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and hopefully, you'll, hopefully that'll come through as, as we go along. Hey, Brett, this is Tom. Can I say one thing real quick? Yep. Uh, what I think would be, it seems to have worked best now doing these Zoom things is if we just let you go through it and yep. people can put in their questions in the chat box. And so then um, if you happen to see it, want to stop, great, but otherwise they'll just be logged there and we can, you know, go through yep. them again. No, that's perfect, Tom. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I won't be looking at that. Okay. So everybody box, just put your so. questions in the, in the chat box. Yep. No. Th yep. Thanks for that. So first of all, let me just disclose, um, I'm on a couple of advisory boards that really to have no direct impact on the content of the talk. But I thought it would be important to kind of as, a, as an outline for the talk, um, convey uh, what I hope to promote as some key points along the way. Um, I've tried to assemble some, some order to this. It's, it's sort of all tied together, but I think you'll you'll get the picture um, literally and figuratively along the way. Um, you know, again, as I indicated already that, you know, one of the points is that um, exercise can reveal uh, mechanisms for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And certainly these are complex human diseases. These are not, you know, monogenic, you know, diseases. So they're not so simple as looking at a gene defect. And Exercise is obviously um, multipotent in terms of its effects on different genes and pathways. And, and I think it's important to, to consider, you know, all the potential effects that exercise has, but at the same time, really try to drill down on some of the specific effects that exercise has, particularly again, in, in metabolic disease. So another key aspect or key point that I'd like to promote today is that um, exercise improves aspects of energy metabolism that are uh, what I would consider intractable or resistant to diet-induced weight loss. Uh, clearly, exercise and weight loss are frontline therapies for obesity and type 2 diabetes. And um, oftentimes, uh, too often, I think that, you know, lifestyle modification that include both exercise and weight loss sort of get lumped together, but I think it's important for us to consider that they do have very profoundly different effects on metabolism, and I'll, I'll highlight some of those um, along the way. As Marcus indicated in, in the introduction, um, we, we've done a lot of work over the years on intramicellular lipids and insulin resistance, and I'll, I'll highlight some of that work. And how we got started with that and kind of what the evolving story is with, with that field. And, a lot, and, and at the same time, um, highlight some of the work that we've done over the years in this concept of metabolic flexibility that encompasses both um, insulin resistance as well as impaired fatty acid metabolism and obesity and, and type two diabetes. Um, and then also tied into this is some of the work that we've done around exercise and mitochondrial capacity. So first of all, just to set the stage to make sure we're on the same page, um, skeletal muscle insulin resistance is clearly an important aspect of the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. Um, you could argue strongly that insulin resistance in skeletal muscle is a cause of type 2 diabetes. I think there's a lot of many lines of evidence that would support that. Um, but essentially for the, you know, for the, uh, for those in the audience who are not really thinking about insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes every day, like, like I used to, and I guess in some ways still do, um, you know, when insulin resistance in peripheral tissues, uh, muscle and adipose tissue develops, the pancreas somehow senses this insulin resistance. It tries to overcome the insulin resistance by secreting more insulin. Um, and this is why typically hyperinsulinemia uh, 
can in some uh, scenarios be used as a surrogate um, as insulin resistance because the pancreas is secreting more insulin to overcome this insulin resistance. Eventually, the pancreas, of course, uh, fails in many people, and this leads to frank hyperglycemia or type 2 diabetes. So, um, and this is not even really bringing in the, the liver to the, to the picture here on the left, where insulin resistance in the liver can also exacerbate or even cause this by, um, by overproduction of, inappropriate overproduction of glucose leading to hyperglycemia. And also to set the stage, when we talk about mechanisms of insulin resistance, I think it's important to point out a couple things. One is I consider that there are multiple causes or multiple nodes of insulin resistance. Uh, it's not just intramyocellular lipids or mitochondrial dysfunction or inflammation or, um, you know, pick your other favorite pathway that instigates insulin resistance. Um, I think it's too, too simple to think that insulin resistance is caused by one, one pathway or mechanism. So I think it's important to, to highlight that. The other important highlight here is that, um, you know, this evidence has to be translatable to humans. Um, you know, I would often go to the uh, diabetes meetings or the obesity meetings, and you would see several animal mo models of, you know, uh, in which obesity or diabetes is cured in mice, but certainly not in humans. So um, while that evidence is certainly important, um, I think it has to be translatable. So let's begin the story with uh, potential causes of skeletal muscle insulin resistance. And sort of my foray into this when I was a postdoctoral fellow with David Kelly at the University of Pittsburgh um, was investigating um, altered body composition, including excess abdominal fat accumulation in obesity and insulin resistance. We also begun, had begun to look at a increased accumulation of lipids, both in and around the muscle. If you see this schematic going from a CT scan on the left, in which you can see highlighted in purple there, the, the intermuscular adipose tissue, which is not defined as intramyocellular cellular lipid, but rather intermuscular adipose tissue. And this is truly adipose tissue. And it's a very important adipose tissue depot, one that we continue to be very interested in biologically and mechanistically, but it's, 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 um, it's too much to, to go into this today. And it's really reserved um, as a topic for another day, perhaps my colleague, Lauren Sparks, who's who's uh, really investigating this in a big way is, is it will be in a position to, to talk more about the mechanisms of, of intramuscular adipose tissue at some point with you all. But I think this, this schematic highlights that if you would take a, a needle biopsy like we commonly do in our research studies, um, you can clearly see the intramyocellular lipids stained with oil red O here in the middle micrograph. And then if you took out one of these muscle fibers from a biopsy, which we've done, and you can see that using a scanning electron micrograph uh, on the right, you can see in one muscle cell, the, the lipid droplets that are lined up apparently in a very organized fashion along the muscle fibers. Um, but this really highlights going from intramuscular adipose tissue all the way to triglycerides mostly um, identified here in a single muscle fiber as an intramyocellular lipid depot. And we were interested in this um, as many other groups were in the mid to late 90s. And the study that you see here before you is a cross-sectional study in which we uh, perform hyperinsulinemic glycemic clamps in subjects ranging from type 2 diabetes in the red triangles who are very insulin resistant across the board to obese subjects uh, in circles and the lean subjects in the squares here. And we saw a striking, fairly strong association between intramyocellular lipid content in the biopsies with the severity of insulin resistance. And um, this, this was um, contemporary with other 
uh, findings in animal models and in humans at the time showing that intramyocellular triglycerides were associated with, with insulin resistance. And this was really part of um, what many had thought was, was, a, um, was part of the impaired fatty acid metabolism, perhaps a decrease in mitochondria content and mitochondria function in type 2 diabetes, championed by, um, by many groups, prominently uh, Jerry Shulman at Yale and others. David Kelly, who I worked with, had, um, was showing at the time that mitochondria content in type 2 diabetes and muscle was, was lower. So this accumulation of muscle triglycerides seemed to fit with this concept that mitochondria uh, content and function was lower in insulin resistance, leading to an impaired capacity for fat oxidation um, that subsequently um, led to accumulation of, of more lipids that impaired um, insulin signaling and led to insulin resistance. And so we also were pursuing this line of reasoning along with looking at intramyocellular lipids in looking in, a, in lean and obese subjects at their ability to, to essentially burn fat in skeletal muscle. And so these studies that you see here were limb balance studies in which we did leg RQ measures essentially um, uh, respirometry or leg, leg exchange um, calorimetry um, across the limb showing that uh, a, a 0.7 would be fat oxidation on the scale there and a 1.0 is complete glucose oxidation. And then going from fasting to insulin stimulated, you see uh, quite clearly that lean subjects go from fasting, predominantly fat oxidation to predominantly glucose oxidation during insulin stimulation. And this was in stark contrast to obese subjects who use less fat during fasting conditions and then did not stimulate glucose oxidation under insulin stimulation. So this was really the classic insulin resistance um, paired with an, uh, a lower fat oxidation in obesity compared to, uh, to lean subjects. So our way of thinking was that this insulin resistance was part of an overall metabolic inflexibility in obesity that in also encompassed an impaired fat oxidation. So you see this schematic that we were promoting um, in the late 90s with David Kelly showing that um, a metabolic flexi flexible condition like in the lean subjects, um, the muscle in this case could, could use or burn energy, fat or carbohydrate um, appropriately for the condition, whether it's fasting or insulin stimulation compared to the metabolic inflexibility condition in obesity, which um, in which the obese uh, condition could not oxidize the, the appropriate substrate. And so our next question was, okay, if obesity is associated with metabolic inflexibility, the, the best way really to get at cause and effect, or one of the ways is to um, reduce obesity with weight loss and to see if this improves insulin resistance and overall metabolic flexibility. So this was the question that we had. And in these same subjects, after a four month low calorie diet, they lost about 8% of their body weight. You can see here that their insulin stimulated glucose oxidation improves with weight loss, but their fasting fat oxidation does not change at all with weight loss. So only one component or aspect of the metabolic flexibility, in this case, insulin sensitivity, was improved with weight loss, but not the impaired fat oxidation. So this was one of our first clues that the impaired fat oxidation and perhaps accumulation of muscle lipids may not be mechanistically linked to insulin resistance, because when you lose weight, you improve one and not the other. And so along that line of reasoning, our other question was, does the improved insulin resistance with weight loss also coincide with a reduced 
intramyocellular lipid content. And again, really using weight loss more or less as a tool to try to unravel this from a mechanistic, or I guess more of a, a cause and effect perspective with the idea that if you intervene and see a change in one and a change in the other, um, it's a little closer to uh, actual causal uh, relationship. And so what we did in this study, um, we looked at the effects on, of weight loss on intramyocellular lipids in uh, muscle biopsies of the vastus lateralis and compared to lean, the obese subjects without and with type two diabetes had more intramyocellular lipids and when these subjects lost about eight to 10% of their body weight, there was a significant decrease in their intramyocellular lipids. So, so far, this was lining up pretty well that intramyocellular lipids may be a cause of insulin resistance because when you lose weight, improve insulin resistance, and you uh, decrease intramyocellular lipids. And these data are the insulin sensitivity data with glucose clamp, again, showing that coinciding with the decrease in intramyocellular lipid, insulin sensitivity improves with weight loss. So one of the next questions that we had was, does the improved insulin resistance with exercise coincide with the reduced intramyocellular lipid? We knew that both exercise and weight loss would likely improve insulin sensitivity, so it made sense to to look at the effects on intramyocellular lipids. Um, but before we launched into an exercise training study, we brought a group of highly trained athletes into the clinical research center and did biopsies and glucose clamps. And this was the observation of the athlete's paradox that, that uh, Marcus so nicely articulated in the introduction was that you know, you've seen this relationship already today that this intramyocellular lipid in sedentary subject is fairly strongly associated with insulin resistance, but the athletes were literally off the line. They had higher insulin sensitivity and relatively high intramyocellular lipid on par with those in type two diabetes, in fact. Um, so this was the paradox because again, at the time it was becoming almost dogmatic that insulin resistance was um, caused by excess accumulation of intramyocellular triglycerides. So I think this observation was important because, you know, in some ways it steered people, started steering people in the right direction. It wasn't necessarily telling us what did cause insulin resistance, but I think it clearly told us what did not cause insulin resistance, and that was the triglycerides in the muscle. And this was really important for us um, when Paul Cohen came to work with me as a postdoc in Pittsburgh to begin to explore different lipids in the muscle that accumulated, um, including ceramides and diacylglycerol. And so our group, along with others, um, began to kind of steer away from triglycerides as the nexus or the important lipid in muscle to, to these other lipid intermediates like diacylglycerol and ceramide. And of course, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't have done this work without, you know, more modern technology, mass spec technology to, to measure these lipids. So the science, the, you know, this is a, a case where the technology allowed the science really to kind of catch up to what the reality was. Um, so, one of Paul's first studies as a postdoc was um, uh, a fairly simple but important one. I remember Paul came to me and said, you know, these intervention studies are great, Brett, but I, you know, I can't spend the ne next two years of my postdoc just, you know, waiting around for data to come in from the intervention. So, you know, let's think about something else we can do with the data. So we begin to look at some baseline data and and have the idea that let's look at insulin resistant subjects versus insulin sensitive subjects based on clamp data. And, um, and Paul really championed um, this effort and essentially looked in the biopsies at ceramide content uh, in these insulin resistant subjects. And you can clearly see across the board 
that muscle ceramide levels are elevated in insulin resistance, um, pretty much re regardless of which ceramide species you look at. And certainly if you look at the total, the unsaturated, the saturated, they're, they're double or more uh, the level of ceramide compared to insulin sensitive subjects. In contrast, um, the amount of disylglycerol did not, at least in this cross-sectional comparison, seem to differentiate or distinguish insulin resistant uh, skeletal muscle. Um, and again, this was at a time where um, many others were promoting disylglycerol as the cause of muscle insulin resistance, but in our hands, clearly, it didn't seem to be the case, regardless of what disylglycerol species we looked at. And then, so we did a follow-on study uh, with Francesca Amati, who was a PhD student of mine at the time um, in Pittsburgh, in which we did another cross-sectional comparison of trained athletes, sedentary normal weight and sedentary obese subjects. Again, you can clearly see that the trained subjects have higher insulin sensitivity compared to sedentary subjects. And we, we also looked in the biopsies at ceramide content and like before, or like we hypothesized, we showed that the obese insulin resistant muscle was, had a, high, a much higher uh, ceramide content compared to the trained muscle or even the untrained uh, normal weight uh, muscle. So again, more evidence that ceramide was at least strongly associated with muscle insulin resistance. The diacylglycerol story started to become a little more complicated, um, contrast to what we had hypothesized, which was the diacylglycerol would be lower in the athletes. Um, we showed here that in contrast, or contrary to that, that the diacylglycerol levels were actually higher in the athletes. And this was true in the total diacylglycerol on the left, and the saturated species of disylglycerol in the middle um, panel there. But here's where it gets more complicated um, because if you look at the different species of disylglycerol in the muscle biopsies, you see that if you look at the unsaturated uh, fatty acid on one position of disylglycerol, they're higher in the trained muscle. But if you look at the species of disylglycerol in which the, the lipids, the fatty acids are unsaturated on both positions, it's, it's completely flipped around, right? So in this, spe these species of diacylglycerol are associated with insulin resistance. They're higher in obesity. Um, so again, the story of intramyocellular lipids, DAGs and ceramides becomes more and more complicated. Um, it really seems to matter which species of lipid is in the muscle and not only which species, but where they're located in the cell, whether they're located in the plasma membrane, in the cytosol and lipid droplets. So um, we, I wouldn't say we've, we've really left this alone. We're, we're, we're still very interested in this. I'll just say that it's, um, it's become very complicated. Brian Bergman in Colorado has done a really nice job in his group of, of really diving deep into these different lipid species, not only the, the type of lipid, but where they are in the cell. And I think the story is going to um, be more complicated, but hopefully um, more revealing as, as we get into these different, different lipid species and their location. And so, again, like, like the lipid story in muscle, the, the um, the concept of exercise and metabolic flexibility, and in particular, the effects of exercise on mitochondria um, was uh, coinciding with this concept that certain lipids may be elevated in, in muscle in trained athletes, other lipids may be elevated in insulin resistance. So, you know, was it possible that mitochondrial capacity or function and fat oxidation, metabolic flexibility somehow tied, tied all this together. And so in Francesca Amati's study, along with measuring intramyocellular lipids, we also measured mitochondria content. Um, we did it in, in a number of ways. We, we looked at electron microscopy, which is what you see here. 
Um, these are actual electron micrographs taken from a couple of our subjects. You can see the, the micrograph on the left is from a, one of our trained athletes compared to a sedentary subject on the right. And, you know, you don't have to even do any stereology or quantification to clearly see that the athlete has many more mitochondria compared to the sedentary subject. Um, but if the picture is not evidence enough, we did quantify these and in many subjects and found that the mitochondria volume density on, on EM is certainly higher in this case, about twofold higher. So if you're trained, you have about double the amount of mitochondria in your muscle um, relative to if you're untrained. And so um, this was part of the story of looking at what distinguishes insulin resistant versus insulin sensitive uh, skeletal muscle. And we had also done some intervention studies, uh, exercise intervention studies to look at not only improved insulin sensitivity, but improvements in fatty acid oxidation. Um, this was whole body uh, calorimetry uh, uh, with this study. It was not leg calorimetry. But the take home message here is that we saw that in subjects who had greater improvements in fat oxidation also had greater improvements in insulin sensitivity. Now, this is not cause and effect, but again, it's intervention data. So I think it's a little stronger line of evidence that show that um, exercise has effects on both uh, fat oxidation as well as insulin sensitivity um, with, with the overall idea or you know, conclusion here that in contrast to weight loss, exercise seems to improve both aspects of metabolic flexibility, that is fat oxidation and insulin sensitivity. In other studies, we did head-to-head -head comparisons of exercise and calorie restriction um, in terms of insulin sensitivity. And you can see here that exercise and calorie restriction induced weight loss both improve insulin sensitivity. And we and others had shown that before. It's just nice to see it in a direct comparison in the, in the same study here. In contrast though, um, when you look at the biopsies and the subject before and after the interventions in exercise and calorie restriction, only exercise improves mitochondria uh, content either with volume density on electron microscopy or cardiolipin content, um, which is a marker or a phospholipid that's specific to inner mitochondrial membrane. And you can see on the bottom panels here, panel A, only exercise but not calorie restriction increases electron transport chain activity as well as beta oxidation activity. Um, so calorie restriction due to weight loss doesn't do anything to markers of mitochondria content or capacity. Um, these only seem to be affected um, by exercise. More recently, we've done a randomized controlled trial, and this is all unpublished, but I'll go ahead and show it anyway, because I think the data are soon to come out, or at least be submitted for publication. Um, this was a, a six-month intervention that we started in Pittsburgh and finished here in Orlando when we made the move. Um, health education control compared to diet-induced weight loss only compared to weight loss plus exercise. Weight loss and uh, without and with exercise improve insulin sensitivity. You can see that there's a significantly greater improvement in insulin sensitivity when subjects add exercise to the weight loss um, intervention. And you can see here, and I'll go a little into a little bit of the data um, with biopsy, but it was a fairly complex study in terms of the phenotyping. We did VO2 max tests, DEXA scans, MRIs for body composition, muscle biopsies, the glucose clamp before and after, um, um, et cetera. So, um, and along with the six month intervention. So um, a, a complex study to pull off, we randomized 80, uh, 82 subjects um, and completed uh, analysis on muscle biopsies with respect to mitochondria function in I think about 65 of these subjects um, across control, weight loss only, and weight loss plus exercise. And in this study, um, we 
utilize the uh, high resolution respirometry methodology, the uh, Ouroboros O2K, in which we took part of the muscle biopsy and with permeabilized muscle fibers, looked at oxygen consumption in response to fatty acid and carbohydrate uh, substrate. And all of this work was led by um, Giovanna De Stefano, a postdoc in our group, who's really led the charge overall in, in this methodology for us, has done a really tremendous job. And there's one slide of this unpublished data that I'll show in these control weight loss only and weight loss plus exercise subjects. Um, and that is, you can clearly see that these are pre-post data. It's only the, ex the group who has exercise that has any improvement in mitochondria. Um, I will, I'll call it capacity or, or function. Um, it's not to say that content doesn't increase because content does increase when you exercise. But the take home message here is that calorie restriction due weight loss does nothing to mitochondrial capacity. Um, but there's a robust improvement when you add exercise. So clearly calorie restriction and exercise have very different effects on skeletal muscle energy metabolism. And to make a, a finer point on that, um, Paul Cohen and I did this study in bariatric surgery patients. These were patients who underwent gastric, Roux and Y gastric bypass surgery. And we showed that compared to subjects who lost weight only with surgery, that subjects who were randomized, patients who were randomized to a structured exercise program got additional improvements in insulin sensitivity despite losing um, sometimes upward uh, 30, 40 kilograms of body weight. So despite losing massive amounts of weight, um, you can still see improvements in insulin sensitivity with exercise. In these, in these patients, there didn't seem to be sort of um, an upward limit on their improvement in insulin sensitivity. In the control subjects, it seemed to track pretty well with weight loss, but again, the take home message here is that you can still see additional improvements when you do some moderate um, exercise. And like before, we, we did muscle biopsies before and after the intervention, and like the diet-induced weight loss study, we see that the bariatric surgery-induced weight loss does not do anything to mitochondria function with high resolution respirometry measures, but it's the group who does exercise that you see these improvements in complex one, complex two, and overall electron transport chain activity, um, supporting again the concept that you really need exercise to improve your mitochondria function, that weight loss alone doesn't do it. And so I would say in summary, um, comparing and contrasting the effects of exercise and calorie restriction induced weight loss on metabolism. They both improve insulin sensitivity, but in, in my view, there are clearly different nodes of insulin resistance that are likely improved by these interventions because again, calorie restriction and exercise both improve insulin sensitivity, but only exercise seems to improve mitochondria uh, capacity and perhaps function along with fatty acid oxidation and skeletal muscle. Obviously with exercise, there's a greater fatty acid flux in muscle, um, more energy coming in, more energy going out of the lipid droplet. So there's an overall greater energy flux, I would say, as well as fatty acid flux through the tissue. In contrast to calorie restriction, you're certainly reducing fatty acid intake, but you're not altering fatty acid oxidation. Uh, so there are likely other pathways that are being affected that affect insulin resistance, perhaps intramyocellular lipid accumulation, but likely not fat oxidation in this, in this way. So with that, um, that, uh, that really, I think, tells the story of, of how I started in this area using exercise as a, as a tool to try to unravel some of the mechanistic um, uh, aspects of insulin resistance and the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. Um, certainly acknowledge David Kelly and my collaborators of Pittsburgh over the years. Um, 
the TRI, the Translational Research Institute here in Orlando has been really great to work with. I'm super happy to be here, looking forward to the next several years. Um, again, I wanna thank Marcus for the invitation and his friendship and uh, we're, our work together on MotorPack and hopefully many other studies to come. So uh, thanks very much. Hey, thanks so much, Brett. Um, so um, that's awesome. Um, right now, everyone, if you would, um, if you could type in questions into the chat and then we can just go one by one. I think maybe the easiest way. Um, and I, I'm just going to go ahead and I was typing out. I'm just going to go ahead and ask you, Brett, while others type, type this out. Um, I assume that most of what you're talking about when you say exercise in your talk is uh, you're talking about aerobic training. Am I correct on that? Yes. And so um, some, you know, I've seen work in the past and I, I think I remember it from the Pennington group, maybe when Tim Church was there, where they combined aerobic and resistance training, uh, looking specifically maybe at the glucose side of things. Um, and, you know, there's evidence of increased uh, mitochondrial capacity when you integrate resistance training. I guess what I was wondering about is, as it relates to the fatty acid oxidation side of things, the, the fatty acid flux you're talking about, you know, what we know about um, either resistance training in isolation, in combination, or high intensity interval training, like uh, resistance type hit. Um, as it relates to the, the fatty acid oxidation piece of kind of insulin resistance maintenance. Do you happen to know anything? So the gist of the question, Tom, is, is how does resistance exercise or some of these other forms of exercise affect fat oxidation? Yeah, I guess in newer ways. And so, so uh, particularly HIT that might incorporate, yep. you know, um, <laughs> as it relates to managing insulin resistance. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And, you know, as you know, these, these studies are just scratching the surface with exercise effects. I mean, we could certainly discuss exercise response variation. You know, we typically present the mean data, right, on even on a, just traditional aerobic exercise intervention programs. But it's clear from, you know, Lauren Sparks and Tim Church's work going back to their studies and Lauren's more recent work on exercise response variation that um, not, not everybody responds the same way to, the, to a given exercise dose. And I would say it's the same for the type of exercise. Um, clearly resistance exercise can improve insulin sensitivity, um, high intensity interval training as well. Um, so I think the, you know, the bottom line, there's still a lot to do um, in the field with respect to how these different forms of exercise affect metabolic flexibility, insulin resistance. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, this is certainly not uh, putting the lid on uh, the effects of exercise on these, on, on these parameters or pathways, still, still a lot to do. Um, so, you know, yeah. Uh, well, Brad, this is Marcus. Uh, I don't know, just quickly jump in. I know there's going to be some other questions. Uh, first, I wanted to say uh, thanks very much. That was an outstanding uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, wanted to point out that uh, Gary Hunter was having a difficult time connecting, and so he kind of missed our introduction, but uh, he's with us now. So, uh, Gary, thanks for joining, and uh, I'm sure there may be some questions or some back and forth between you and Brett. But, uh, again, it's a great honor to have this eighth annual lecture uh, the Hunter Lecture, and, and glad Gary could join us. Um, Brad, I, I don't know, it's it's a bit premature, but, you know, you may want to offer any comment on what the Motor Pack Initiative uh, hopes to do in terms of revealing some of these molecular transducers uh, with regard to resistance versus endurance training, as well as acute exercise, and then uh, also maybe mention, uh, I didn't mention this in the outset, I should probably mention it to the audience, that Brett is the chair of the Ancillary and Pilot Studies Committee for Motor Pack. And so there are opportunities. <laughs> Sorry. 
So there will be opportunities for people to potentially get engaged in motorbike down the road. But Brett, do you have any comments in that regard? Yeah, Marcus, thanks. Thanks for setting that up. I think it was a great setup. Um, you know, I think we're going to learn a lot from MotorPAC on these, as you said, these molecular transducers um, from aerobic and resistance exercise, not only the chronic training effects, but the acute exercise effects um, on many pathways. And I think, you know, the energy metabolism pathways, um, I'm biased, but I think they're going to be front and center. I guess I'm not biased. I think the I think the evidence will, will lead us that way because Marcus, as you, you already know, we've seen from the very early animal uh, studies data in motor pack that the, you know, the key pathways that seem to be affected by um, at least the aerobic exercise and the animal models are the, the mitochondrial pathways and fatty acid oxidation pathways. So I, I think we're gonna see some similar things in the human studies. Um, and I, I think we'll see some markers that are related to, to insulin resistance and fat oxidation and mitochondrial pathways. Um, you know, we don't have direct phenotypes in motor pack, as you know, of insulin resistance. And um, um, well, we, we do have, we'll have some fat oxidation data from the acute exercise valve. And we just got an ancillary study funded to, to look at in vivo mitochondrial um, capacity with NMR spectroscopy. So that's going to be exciting. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think we're going to learn a lot more in motor pack um, about these molecular transducers. And I think it very importantly um, about the response variation, because clearly some people are, you know, going to respond in stronger um, or different ways than other people. And I think that'll perhaps give us some clues about how exercise affects these different pathways. So I'd like to butt in here if I could. Can, can people hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, first, I'd like to thank Marcus and Tom for continuing the Hunter Lecture. Um, and one comment I do have is, I don't know what you're going to do next year, but it seems like each year you be, be bring in a, a stronger uh, speaker, and uh, I don't know how you're going to improve on on Brett this year, um, or next year, if, if, assuming that you do it again next year. Uh, I do have a question for Brett. When you did the insulin sensitivity measures, when did you do them relative to the last exercise bout? Yeah, that's a great question, Gary. Um, and before you came on, I I, I said how much I enjoyed our interactions when I, you know, when I came down a few times to UAB and um, thanks, thanks for joining and it's an honor to, to give this lecture um, in your name. So thanks. Um, so that, as you know, Gary, the timing of the last exercise bout is important because um, you want to try to distinguish the acute exercise effects from the chronic training effects. And, and we've always struggled with that, I think, as, as you and many others have, because there's no, there's no perfect cutoff point in terms of you know when you go from an acute response to a chronic response, um, we've we've chosen 36 to 48 hours, more closer to 48 hours after the acute exercise bout, um, because in our view, um, if you go longer than two days after the last exercise bout, first of all, it's it's sort of counter to what our exercise recommendations are. Exercise most days of the week. And second of all, clearly, um, you know, your training effects can start to wane um, even after a couple of days. So we've always viewed it sort of as, as, as a bit of a compromise, but you're, you're right. You don't, you certainly don't want it to, you know, want to do it the day after. You want some separation between the last exercise bout and your, and your, you know, your glucose clamp measurement. Yeah, that's, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I guess that, suggest then at least that the, the um, exercise effect lasts for 48 hours. We, we did a study uh, a few years ago in which we were looking at the acute effects of, of high intensity versus moderate intensity exercise. And we only saw an increase in insulin sensitivity after the uh, 22 hours after the high intensity exercise bout. Um, with uh, we also looked at n uh, no exercise 
Uh, but we did 72 hours, and at 72 hours, insulin sensitivity increase had largely disappear disappeared. So it's, yeah. it's nice to hear 48 hours is, we could go two days. <laughs> yeah, right. No, but I completely agree. It seems to, you know, that, that effect seems to, to disappear relatively quickly. And it's, um, I guess it's, you know, it's a little bit uh, discouraging, right? If you train for, you know, months or years and you don't exercise for three days, that improvement goes away. Um, but I think there's some truth to that. And, you know, some, I think really speaks to the concept that, um, you know, you have to, you have to exercise almost every day to keep, keep up with your effects. It's not like you can take a, a blood pressure pill and then it's good for a week, right? <laughs> this exercise in some ways is similar. Thanks, Gary, uh, for the question and uh, Brett. So uh, we have a number of questions in the chat, uh, Brett. I'll just read them and go through them um, as they came in. Uh, uh, so Kylie Heitman asks, in regard to the increase in intramuscular lipid in type 2 diabetes, what other disease states do you think this occurs in? Uh, that's hard to tell. I mean, I, th I think other diseases that that would involve, you know, a metabolic inflexibility, um, dysregulated energy metabolism um, could certainly be at play. Uh, so I guess from there, you know, take your pick. Uh, this is from uh, Anna Thalaker Mercer said, very nice talk. Uh, she's curious whether you measured changes in branch chain fatty acids in your studies. Branch chain amino acids? It says branch chain fatty acids. So Anna, you want to clarify? Fatty acids. I'm just curious because of the catabolism that would happen in muscle in some of these cases, some of the amino acids that can be attached to the fatty acids get, can get altered and cause adverse effects. So we've been working with some people to study the branch chain fatty acids, and I'm just curious whether you have about or have measured them. No, it's a great question. This is where I say no, we haven't, but if you're interested, I got a freezer full of samples for you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Always the best response. Uh, let me see, so Catherine Jones wants to know, so now that we know some of these pathways, you know, what are the behavioral implications uh, that will allow us to change how we prescribe exercise as medicine? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a short, simple, but yet very complicated question. Um, you know, what I always tell people is that I, I do the type of exercise research that um, is really about when you actually do the exercise, what are the biological effects, um, you know, which is essentially efficacy research. Um, I think, you know, I think change in behavior and effectiveness research type of, you know, behavioral modifications is extremely important. And it certainly speaks to the very, you know, the variability and exercise responses. Um, but it's really a whole other field of research. Um, I would say though, that the more, and this is, this is my view that the more evidence that we can, we can come up with promoting the by, you know, the, beneficial of biological effects of exercise, I think it just makes for a stronger overall message about the health benefits of exercise. And I think that that concept kind of gets lost sometimes, right? That, um, well, we know exercise is good for us. So, you know, just, you know, the answer is just to have more people do it. Well, maybe part of the answer to have more people do exercise is to have more, you know, evidence base um, that exercise works. And, you know, hopefully, eventually that, that message will be relayed to the, to the lay public and it'll be part of the overall, you know, message that exercise is, is better for us. Okay. Um, let me see here. So from Sarah Deemer said, thanks for the great talk. Would you expect a different response in uh, mitofunction to weight loss in an individual on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet? Um, given the necessary changes in the upregulation of fat metabolism? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm not sure about the macronutrient composition effects. Um, you know, it is a good question. Um, we haven't done those studies, but it, it really makes me ponder the potential 
of you know some of these um, alternate forms of calorie restriction, like intermittent fasting or time restricted eating, um, you know, compared to traditional calorie restriction, maybe these types of interventions will will promote better you know fat oxidation. Uh, but I I don't think anybody's really looked at that. I I know there's some you know. Um, some data on metabolism, but specifically looking at metabolic flexibility and, um, you know, fat, you know, fat oxidative capacity. I'm not sure those studies have really got at that, but I think that's partly where that field needs to go. Uh, it's from Steve Malin said, great talk. What are your thoughts on uh, sex difference in response to weight loss? on insulin sensitivity and mitochondria slash fat oxidation and does age matter in this i guess referencing the sex difference so sex differences and age differences yeah uh first of all steve congratulations on your new position um uh so i mean we don't see gender differences in these responses so much um sometimes we'll see that women at least pre and perimenopausal women might have a greater fat oxidation capacity. It seems like in postmenopause that 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 starts to, that difference starts to disappear. Um, it's not quite clear. Barbara Gower and others may have some data on that. Um, and aging, you know, it seems like older people can respond quite well to these interventions. Um, you know, we might have some data that suggests that that older people don't respond as well to, to diet, you know, diet and use weight loss um, compared to younger people. Um, but they seem to respond to the exercise quite well. And I think Steve and others have shown that, so. Okay. Um, and for the time being, last question, unless others, you know, you know, if you want to ask your questions, feel free to chime in. Before I ask this last one, uh, currently I also remind everyone, for the trainees and junior faculty, if you want to join afterward, uh, Pranima will post a link. It'll be a separate session um, that, that you're welcome to join and, and talk with Brett. Uh, Liliana Baptista asks, she's wondering if there's anything in the literature with other class, other lipid classes to improve fat oxidation, uh, namely the use of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids on insulin resistance. Um, and then kind of references that there's evidence of an antioxidant can improve the effect of cardiolipin on the mitochondrial membrane. So summarizing, do you have any information on that in athletes or potential interventions? I guess, uh, Liliana, the question is really related to it as an interventional approach using, you know, fatty acids as an intervention. Yeah, I know it's a great question, Liliana. I appreciate that. Um, so in terms of fatty, you know, exogenous fatty acids is an intervention to improve fatty acid oxidation. Um, you know, there's a, there's a line of research in inborn errors of metabolism, inborn errors of fatty acid metabolism that, you know, these, these kids and adults who have um, uh, genetic defects in beta oxidation, for example, long chain fatty acid, long chain acyl uh, dehydrogenase enzyme defects and so forth. So they can't oxidize fat very well. It turns out if you give if you give them odd chain fatty acids, um, it corrects their fatty acid defects because you're essentially bypassing where these defects in fat oxidation are. But those are special cases, right? Those are genetic inborn errors of fat metabolism that can be corrected by giving these patients um, medium chain and medium uh, odd chain fatty acids. Um, so so that. That's one, but in in typical, you know, obesity, insulin resistance, I don't think there's a lot of data indicating that if you give them a certain type of fatty acid, it can be beneficial. Um, that's not to say that if you could enhance fat oxidation overall, it, it could be beneficial, but in terms of exogenous types of fat, um, not quite not quite sure on that. I mean, in the you know, in the endurance performance literature. Um, or air, you know, field, it's, it's been pretty clear that if you give athletes medium chain triglycerides as an exogenous fat substrate, it can increase performance. It gives them an additional substrate to oxidize during exercise. But the problem with those is you, you have to give them too, so much that 
you know, it results in all kinds of GI distress. Um, so that's, you know, that's the pragmatic issue. Uh, so another one more came in uh, from Nathan Stewart. How does calorie restriction compare to exercise in terms of pancreatic function? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of direct comparative studies that have looked at calorie restriction and exercise on, you know, beta cell function, for example, insulin insulin secretion. Um, trying to think of our data. I think in our bariatric surgery studies, exercise didn't seem to have an additional effect on, you know, insulin secretion. But these were mostly non-diabetics, and I think it depends. You know, are you are you studying people who you know, where on the in impaired insulin secretion curve are they? Are they um, still able to, you know, produce and secrete insulin? Or are they, is their pancreas beginning or completely failed? So um, it really matters what end of the, you know, the glucose secretion curve they're on in terms of their ability to respond, I think. So it, it certainly adds another layer of complexity. Anyone else have... Any other questions you'd like to ask now? Um, just want to remind everyone for the trainees. So for every, uh, our T32 trainees, please for sure log in. Um, and then, you know, if you're interested, uh, junior faculty or you know, other trainees from elsewhere, please feel free. Uh, we would encourage you to use that time. Uh, uh, Brett has uh, generously donated his time for that. So please uh, use his expertise related to whatever, you, you know, career development in this particular talk. Um, the, the information is in the chat box right now. Um, unless anyone else has any other burning questions. I'd just like to thank Brett one more time for a great talk. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Gary. Thanks. Thanks absolutely. a lot. Absolutely. The, the clap part here is always awkward, Brett, with, uh, you know, we can get <laughs> a variety of Zoom reactions and unmute and clap. Uh, but uh, it's nice to see. I think we have a number of people who are showing their appreciation, and we uh, thank you for bearing with the, the new world of lectures on Zoom, and uh, we really appreciate your time. And Tom, Tom, thank you so much, and congratulations to you for your in, in your new role as well. I'll look forward to working you over the next many years. I appreciate it. So. All right, well, thanks everyone so much for joining today. Uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to be able to connect with people, uh, colleagues and, and maybe new faces across the country. And we even have some international speakers hopefully on our uh, agenda this year. So I uh, look forward to it. And um, you know, we'll, I'll double check with Pranima that everyone gets set up in the trainee session afterward. But uh, thanks again, Brett. And thanks to everybody for joining today. So have a great rest thanks, of your week.